So I'm headed to the United Kingdom on Friday to teach a course on the evolutionary philosophies or the organic philosophies of Friedrich Schelling and Alfred North Whitehead. And it's a short course, it's five days long. It's titled Physics of the World Soul. And the course is sort of premised upon the idea that contemporary scientific cosmology, um, physical cosmology, has uh, entered into a state of what I would refer to as epicyclic um, paradigmatic development. And what does that mean? Um, it means that just as prior to Copernicus, the old Ptolemaic model of the solar system continually needed to be kind of updated with yet another epicycle, yet another circle upon circles to explain the apparent motion of the heavens in a coherent, systematic, geometrical way. And eventually, um, this system of epicycles became so unwieldy that scientists like or astronomers, I should say, like Copernicus, who was also an, a priest, Catholic, but also uh, Neoplatonic, for archetypal reasons, ultimately, um, in addition to the um, sort of scientific reasons, Copernicus was, was led to improve upon this old Ptolemaic model by putting the sun at the center, which dramatically simplified the geometry that was necessary to account for the apparent motion of the heavens, the heavenly bodies. There were um, Pythagorean astronomers in ancient Greece who had also toyed around with the idea of a, a heliocentric model, um, but Cop Copernicus um, brought the idea back in the context of a society that for political and cultural reasons was ripe, was ready for um, this heliocentric initiation. And so Copernicus's idea caught fire and ushered in the scientific revolution and transformed the world. We entered the so-called modern era. And the, the mechanistic model of the universe, um, the mechanistic picture of the world that began with Copernicus, who again was not himself um, materialist or mechanist, he was a Neoplatonist, right? And so he thought the sun should be the center of the solar system for archetypal reasons, because as Plato said, the sun is a sort of, um, it's an image of the good. It's the highest, it is the most beautiful, it is the central altar of the physical universe known to the ancients. So obviously, obviously the modern universe is far larger. Um, but Copernicus, though not mechanistic, gave birth to a mechanistic understanding of the universe. And um, Descartes and Newton became necessary as interpreters of the human condition following the decentering of the human the decentering of Earth and the centering of the Sun, um, and this mechanistic picture was unbelievably successful for hundreds of years. Right? Um, you know, Newton's understanding of uh, gravity and the motion of bodies through space, his understanding of light, optics, um, these discoveries or inventions on Newton's part mathematical and geometrical in, in their substance, ramified in every direction. And, you know, the scientific revolution transformed the world. And it was always tightly wedded to technology, which also transformed the world. So this method continued for several hundred years until right around 1900, right? And Max Planck, Einstein, De Boer, 
as a result of the quantum and relativistic uh, revolutions brought an end to that mechanistic picture where space and time were imagined um, as mere containers and instead ushered in, ushered in a universe where what there finally was, what finally composed the world, was not little particles of inert, simply located um, matter in empty, homogeneous space, but rather energy events interlocked in a community of creative evolution, where mind can no longer be separated from matter. And, you know, I'm attributing this to Einstein and Bohr's scientific discoveries, and obviously um, there's a bit of further interpretation or elaboration required to go from the equations of special and general relativity and, and the equations of quantum mechanics to the type of cosmology that I was just describing, and then that what there finally are are energy events interlocked in a community of creative evolution. In order to get there from 20th century cosmology, relativity and quantum theory and complexity theory as well. Um, these sciences on their own can be interpreted in different ways, right? But I think, and the whole point of this course, Physics of the World Soul, is to make the case that Schelling and Whitehead's um, nature philosophies, their, their philosophies of nature, provide us with the most coherent interpretation of contemporary scientific findings. And that scientific materialism, which was the reigning cosmological vision um, of the modern period, that this no longer adequately um, coheres with or provides a, an adequate interpretation of the scientific data and the, the reigning theories currently in play in physics. So a more coherent interpretation and a more adequate interpretation that wouldn't just allow us to understand physics better, uh, wouldn't, just allow, wouldn't just allow us to understand chemistry and biology and psychology better, but would also allow us to understand the human spirit, to under, understand human consciousness or consciousness in general. Maybe it's not just human. In order to make consciousness cohere with cosmology, right? physical cosmology. Whitehead, Whitehead and Schelling, their, their organic philosophies, I think, are necessary. We can't make human consciousness cohere with physical cosmology if we're going to remain stuck in a materialist um, ontology. If what we finally, if, if what we believe finally exists are just dead, inert particles colliding um, as they fall through empty space, then there's no way to make sense of the findings, again, the findings of 20th century science, or obviously with the, um, you know, self-evident values of our first person experience, of our conscious experience. So in order to make that experience cohere with um, science, I think we need something like a physics of the world soul, something like a philosophy of organism to replace the old philosophy of mechanism, um, something like what Schelling and Whitehead and others like Bergson and Terre de Chardin and uh, and others have, have been saying for centuries now, Schelling since, you know, the first half of the 19th century, and Whitehead since the first half uh, or second quarter, maybe, of, of the uh, 20th century. So there's a lot to unpack in there, and over the course of about 10 hours or so, I think, I'm going to try to to lay it all out and make this case. So... Um, Thanks for letting me think out loud about what it is that I want to say.